So for a long time, uh, certainly through much of the Christian era, we in the West took ourselves to be, as Gilbert Ryle puts it, ghosts in the machine. We took ourselves to be immaterial substances, spirits, souls, minds, somehow incarnate in and acting upon a physical world. And as quaint or confused as the idea of an immaterial soul captaining our body might now seem, these ghosts of the past still haunt us. It is, our, I submit, our underlying folk philosophical picture even now. What it is to be free, we think, is to be able to rise above and direct the natural, corporeal, genetic, social, and biological givens of our existence from some position, point of view, or conceptual framework that eludes their influence. We're free to the extent that we can step back and stand apart from nature and from nurture and to direct our lives as we ourselves see fit. To the extent that we're instead simply car carried along by those external forces, it seems we aren't free. It seems that we're controlled rather than in control of ourselves. So with the picture of the ghost in the machine operating in the background, it's easy to equate freedom with a lack of interference. So long as you're left alone to make of your life what you will, it seems you're free. To the extent that you're interfered with, hindered, or constrained, it seems you're less free. If you're outright forced to do things, you're not free at all. Now, constraints and interferences can appear to the agent, that is to the one acting, from two different directions, so to speak, from in front or from behind. The options you face going forward might be constrained. The doors might all be locked. You might need to choose between your money or your life. Alternatively, the forces at work upon you might uh, determine what you did from behind, so to speak. Uh, uh, though you faced many options, perhaps you were deceived or manipulated so that you chose the third door from the left. It can be natural to characterize this lack of interference or constraint, what has sometimes been called negative freedom, by saying that when you enjoy freedom, what you do is up to you or in your power in the double sense that it in some sense originated with you, that is, you're free from behind, and you had options going forward. At a minimum, you had the option of refraining from so acting. And some of the most traditional Western versions of the problem of free will arise from the tension between, on the one hand, the idea to the extent that we're free to the extent that what we do is up to us or in our power, and on the other hand, uh, divine omni omnipotence and omniscience. A quick review will be helpful. So a classic example appears in the story of Exodus. God explains to Moses that he will harden Pharaoh's heart against the Israelites so that God may display his power. That is to say, God acts directly upon Pharaoh's will from behind, so to speak, changing it to his liking. And it certainly seems that in this case, uh, Pharaoh lacked freedom. What he did, in fact, how he chose, was not up to him or in his power. It was up to God. And there's God and Pharaoh on the board. But even were God to refrain from exerting influence directly on Pharaoh's will, God's omniscience seems to threaten freedom. If the future is already written in God's book of life, it seems that our options going forward are constrained. What happens is not really up to us. Now, in contemporary thought experiments, neuroscientists do duty for the divine. They control people's thoughts in detailed ways by manipulating their brains. They act like God on Pharaoh. There's the neuroscientist. OK, so let's pause to consider what it would be like to be subject to such manipulation. Suppose you've volunteered as a test subject. A team of scientists outfit your head with whatever devices they need to remotely control your thoughts, and they send you out to live your day under their constant direction. Now, they've observed you carefully, and they understand your routines. They've learned what is typical for you, and they will not cause you to think or do anything that would strongly conflict with your usual thought or actions. You live your day. What is it like? Perhaps you decide early that you're not so keen on this experiment after all. You'd rather not be subject to the whims and wishes of these scientists. So you decide to sit quietly at your favorite cafe through the morning doing nothing. It then occurs to you, mid-morning, that of course you must be doing just what the scientists have planned. 
They must have decided that you would sit here quietly doing nothing. Perhaps they were busy with other people. Unhappy about this, you pick yourself up and decide to do something unusual and complicated to show your independence. You decide to take a long walk while recalling your freshman year of high school. But at some point in your walk, you realize that, alas, this too must be the scientists doing their thing. They must be sending you out on this walk, testing your memory. So before long, you conclude that the most sensible thing for you to do is simply to forget about the scientists and get on with your day. Perhaps wondering if your lingering sense of unease and alienation is also the scientists doing. So this thought experiment suggests that the direct manipulation of your thoughts, the direct manipulation of your will, will not present itself to you as you make your decisions and live your life. Your knowledge of the manipulation must be through some other means. Thomas Aquinas makes a related observation. He asks whether, during that episode in Egypt, God did violence to Pharaoh. And he concludes that God did not, because, as he puts it, quote, "'Tis contrary to the notion of violence for a man to be thus drug about by his own will." So should God put his finger right on your will, so to speak, and move you by that lever, God would not, in fact could not, thereby make you do anything that you did not then will to do. So long as we focus on a single slice of time, you cannot, as a logical matter, be made to will anything against your will. If you are successfully made to will it, it is your will. And so your will is thus, in a certain sense, immune or impervious to manipulation, though this is no doubt a hollow and pyrrhic sort of invulnerability. Now whether or not you and Pharaoh are subject to violence, whether or not you're forced to do anything against your will, it seems plain that you are neither, neither of you are either free or responsible. And this is so despite the fact that you may be successfully, you're successfully imposing your will upon various objects, sipping your coffee, going for your walk, enslaving the Israelites. The trouble is not that you're not exerting control over these objects, actions, and people, at least in the limited sense of successfully bringing them to be as you would have them to be. The trouble is that your will itself is being controlled by someone else. You are being caused to make and execute certain decisions. Now notice what just happened in the last two sentences. How easily we, we slid from the thought that your will is being controlled by another, someone else is imposing his or her will upon yours, to the thought that you're being caused to make and execute certain decisions. The two thoughts are different. Not all causes are persons with wills. Most aren't. Yet merely being caused to do what you do by the blind but unyielding forces of nature can seem sufficient to undermine freedom. And indeed, reflecting on the history of Western thought, we see, standing between God and the neuroscientists, the enlightenment with Newton's physics. Physics can do duty for both divine omnipotence and divine omniscience, by both acting upon our physical bodies and brains from behind, and by laying down one possible future world, future for the physical world. So in the picture of the world as it came to be painted in the wake of Enlightenment science, events and states of affairs at a given time are explained by prior events and states of affairs, and the relation between past and future is governed by precise and mathematically describable causal laws or relations. But if our actions involve movements that are part of the unfolding of macrophysical objects, and if the history of macrophysical objects is governed by deterministic causal laws linking past to future, it can seem that our movements are determined by appeal to prior events and states of affairs, which are in turn determined by prior events and states of affairs, which are in turn determined by still earlier ones, and so on, reaching back to the beginning of time. And so it can seem that what we do is not up to us in both senses. We are caused from behind to do what we do, and there's only one possible future before us. Many people find this a deeply unsettling thought. So it's depicted here in the, uh, on the board. And notice 
how these problems can look similar in structure, the god, the neuroscientists, and physics. Okay. It can seem like we're being forced or caused uh, to do what we do. The most natural response to the deeply unsettling thought uh, is to conclude that the events in the physical world must not be wholly governed by the deterministic causal laws. Just as we must stay the hand of God and avoid the meddling of the neuroscientists if we are to be free, so too we must somehow escape the influence of the deterministic forces. The causal chain linking past to future must instead include gaps and breaks. Happily, Newton's physics has been superseded at the quantum level where causal laws are thought to be merely probabilistic. And it can seem that these probabilistic gaps and breaks might allow us the room we need to act freely. Unfortunately, though, in the shift to science, the nature of our problem has changed. When confronting God or the neuroscientist, we confronted another agent, who threat one who threatens our freedom by interfering with manipulate, or manipulating our decisions and choices. And we can understand that threat reasonably well while taking both our own and the other's agency for granted. But determinism is not an interfering agent. It's rather the claim that the processes that underlie our agency, the processes that generate and explain our choices and actions, unfold strictly from earlier states. In the shift to science, we start to consider not interferences or hindrances to agency, but the operation of agency itself. And once we consider this, we encounter a problem that is not resolved simply by denying determinism. Namely, we tend to lose sight of our own agency in explaining it. So I'm going to approach that point more slowly. To start, notice what we accomplish by denying determinism. We break the chains that bind. We create some scope for possibility in what would otherwise be a fixed system. Even now, in medias res, the future might branch in several different directions. And yet, crucially, the fact that the future might even now branch in several different directions does not by itself show that which branch it takes is in any way up to you or in your power. Many things are possible, but not up to you. It's possible that the ticket you bought will win the lottery, that you'll die of a poorly understood disease, that this particle will decay in the next fraction of a second. None of these are up to you or in your power. In a slogan, possibility is not agency. So if deterministic science caused you to worry about whether you can act freely, simply loosening the causal chain making the unfolding forces generating your life less predictable or necessary should not by itself bring you relief. If you're feeling relieved, it's because you've taken the extra step of inserting yourself into the break in the chain. Okay, let's see. So the idea is that we could break the chain at various points and it's not gonna help your freedom at all. If you're feeling relieved, it's because you're thinking that you're breaking the chain right around you. You're leaving yourself some room, and then you're thinking that you have a say over which of the possible futures obtain. Okay. So if you feel relieved, it's because you're presuming that you have some ability to exploit the op open possibilities for your own purposes. How will you do that? Well, presumably, somehow, by exercising your agency. That is, by deciding and acting. But now we have to examine agency more closely and acknowledge a further condition on freedom. Start with the observation that free action must be action. And events qualify as actions only if they're related in the right way to the mind of their subject. In particular, an event that is your action must happen because you meant for something to happen. Maybe not exactly what did happen, maybe you botched the job, but you must have meant for something to happen, and what happens must happen because you meant for something to happen. If we can't understand an event as something that occurred because you meant for something to occur, we can't understand it as your action at all. 
And if we can't find any other explanation for it, we'll think of it as an anomaly or a freak occurrence. Notice next that your meaning for something to happen is the sort of thing that must be able to be made intelligible by appeal to the characteristics of your mind. You must have had some desire, impulse, or urge, some conviction, purpose, plan, belief, or intention, which would explain why you meant to do whatever it was you meant to do. We can't understand you as having meant to do something unless we can appeal to some feature of your psychology that would explain your intention. So if we can't understand an event as something that happened because you meant for something to occur, we'll think of it as a mere happening, perhaps an anomaly or a freak occurrence. And in order to understand an event as something that occurred because you meant for something to occur, we must see that it occurred because of some feature of your mind. And so we arrive at another condition on free action. Free action must be a consequence of the operation of your mind explained by its characteristics. So here's some characteristics that are explaining the action. You're still free back here. OK. So far, so good. Now add the further observation that minds do not simply appear on the scene ready-made and able to make decisions. Rather, psychologies, wills, minds, emerge in their entirety from the stuff of the earth, subject to the hazards of human development, a product of nature and nurture, biology and society, operating in some contested combination, along with a good dose of luck. So now we have the mind emerging from nature and nurture. So once we acknowledge that we emerge from the stuff of the earth, it becomes hard to see how denying determinism is going to help us regain our freedom. Because unlike un otherworldly souls or material substances, immaterial substances, worldly agents cannot, so to speak, occupy the gap opened in the causal chain. We are rather knit in. What we do, both our actions and the outcomes they cause, must be explained by the operation of our minds with its features, and those features are in turn explained by prior features of the world, ultimately by features of the world we did not choose and that we do not control. Now again, let's take this more slowly. Suppose we did appear on the scene ready-made with psychologies formed elsewhere. Suppose we were otherworldly souls inserted into the world like angels stuck into bodies. Let's uh, start ourselves up here. There we go. All right. Oh, and we're going to be in a deterministic world to begin with, like that. Chink. Okay. Now, if we were such creatures, then the fact that the history of the world unfolds inevitably from its prior conditions. And you can see it doesn't really matter that this is no longer in line, right? We still have an, un, an unfolding inevitably. If we were such creatures, the fact that the world unfolds inevitably, inevitably uh, from its prior conditions would indeed eliminate our freedom. In fact, given what we've just noted about action, otherworldly creatures, otherworldly minds, couldn't act in a deterministic world at all. What happens in the world would not be a consequence of the operation of our minds with their extra-worldly characteristics. And if worldly forces somehow acted on otherworldly psychologies from behind, so to speak, uh, we would be forced to do something in a way alien to us in much the way that we would be if we were forced to make decisions by God or by the neuroscientist. And finally, in this scenario, we could restore our freedom, that is, we could regain our ability to act by opening up the right gap in the causal chain. We would then be able to exert our otherworldly influence in those moments where the outcome is prior to uh, our intervention under determined. So denying determinism would remove an alien hindrance to the operation of extra-worldly free spirits. So the solution to the problem that seems most natural, namely deny determinism, would be a solution if the problem determinism posed was the same sort of problem 
that posed by God and by the neuroscientists. And it would pose that kind of problem if we were otherworldly free spirits, free spirits coming into the world from elsewhere formed uh, with characteristics formed there. So it seems to me that certain forms of the intuitive problem of free will appear because we've not yet excised the ghosts of our past. Once we fully embrace our embeddedness in this world, we don't face the same problem that otherworldly agents would face. So here we are, fully embedded. Okay. First, even if our world is deterministic, we can act. Unlike otherworldly agents, what happens in the world is, in part, the result of the operation of our worldly minds. Even if the future couldn't have been different given the past, our actions do make a difference to the future. If we had acted differently, the future would be different. Our actions and our minds are part of the story of what happens in this world. Our problem is not with action, it's with freedom. But our problem isn't with hindrance or interference, the processes that underlie and explain our actions can't be said to interfere with or hinder them. One might think instead it's a problem with constraint. One might think that physical determinism constrains us, not because we can't act, nor because we're being manipulated, but simply because things couldn't have been otherwise. Necessity seems a threat to freedom. But again, Possibility is not agency. So consider, where in this story of worldly action uh, would you insert contingency or possibility to restore freedom? Inserting contingency between your completed decision-making process and what happens next compromises your ability to act. It puts slippage between your will and the world. What you decided to do or bring about might not happen. Inserting contingency instead between your past and your character or personality simply makes your psychological development a bit fluky or lucky. Perhaps we should insert contingency in the midst of the decision-making process itself. We would thus assure that it was not inevitable that you decide as you did. But we do not, by inserting contingency here, make it the case that it's up to you how you decide. We've simply opened that decision process to luck. So while necessity seems a threat, seems in fact to eliminate our agency, contingency is no help. Our underlying problem, it seems, is that we still lack an understanding of agency that makes clear either how determinism threatens it or how contingency or possibility would allow for it. Once we understand ourselves as worldly, we need to understand determinism as the claim that the processes that generate and explain our choices and action unfold strictly from earlier states. But these could hardly be said to interfere with, hinder, or compromise our choices or actions. We should not need to free ourselves from the natural world in order to be free from interference or constraint. And yet when we consider those processes, our agency seems to disappear. So one might return to the thought now that we appear ready on the scene, ready-made, and insist bravely that I'm simply being tangentious in calling such agents otherworldly. Agency, one might say, is an emergent phenomena. It emerges from the physical world in a way that eludes reduction back to it. So if we cast everything in the language of the physical, action will seem to have disappeared from the world. And so the threat we feel is not a threat that arises from determinism. It arises rather from trying to understand human action in physical or mechanistic ter terms. Okay, so this thought is that we've got this picture screwed up. Uh, the Big Bang is about physical things. And there's a physical story that gets told. Uh, But the human story is not reducible to the physical story. Okay, so let's grant everything that this response claims. Human action is not reducible to physical events. 
The concepts needed to describe and explain human action don't bear any systematic or regular relation to the concepts of the physical world. There's no questions posed in one vocabulary that could be answered in the other. The neuroscientists are going to have a hard time manipulating thoughts by tweaking neurons. For that, we should turn to psychologists who work in the medium of desires, wants, and beliefs. Now, these interesting claims are important, but they're not going to solve our new problem. This strategy hopes that though we can't rise up to be angels, rising up from physics into psychology is rising far enough to be free. But unfortunately, simply changing the level of description or analysis, shifting from neurons and chemicals to wants, desires, beliefs, loves and commitments, fears and insecurities, self-esteem and jealousy, uh, does not remove the worry. Loves and commitments, self-esteem and jealousy are explained by forces at work upon you. Perhaps these explanations are not deterministic, but again, we've seen that contingency is no relief. If the victim criminal, due to his or her formative circumstances, lacks the strength of ego or capacity for empathy, needed to regulate his or her desires in more sociable ways, then it seems that he or she cannot regulate his or her desires in more sociable ways. And whether she has the strength of ego or capacity for empathy is a matter of nature, nurture, luck, and his or her past choices. But his or her past choices are ultimately a result of nature, nurture, and luck. And just the same is true of you. If what you do is a function of what you're like, with or without some slippage, and what you're like is a product of what came before, with or without some luck, it seems, intuitively speaking, that you're not free. And yet it seems undeniable that what you're like is a function of what comes before, uh, sorry, that what you do is a function of what you're like, with or without some slippage, and what you're like is a function of what comes before, with or without some luck. And that so it can seem that neither you nor the victim are free to do otherwise. And so I think we can create the basic intuitive problem, the one that appears with enlightenment science, without appeal even to <coughs> physical causation. If we were bothered by Newton, <coughs> Freud will do just as well. So I think the lesson to be drawn is that when we turn from God to science, we encounter a different but still powerful and intuitive problem of free will. Our freedom th seems threatened when we see th that uh, how we choose can be adequately explained, with or without some slippage, by things over which we have no say. So it's unsurprising that the problem we face is not solved by contingency, because it's not generated by determinism. And it's not solved by emergence, because it's not generated by physical or mechanistic causation. The problem is rather that we're having trouble understanding ourselves as agents at all. When we turn to try to explain our agency, we seem to explain it away. So we do have a problem, and I think I can say what it is. But I want first to note that our problem is often overblown. It's often claimed that agency is somehow essentially inexplicable because the standpoint of agency and the standpoint of explanation are somehow incompatible. And this account of the problem is meant at once to provide a solution. But I think that both the account of the problem and the proposed two standpoints solution go too far. I think they both say more than is needed, some of which is false. So to detail, and this is the picture of the two standpoints solution. So to detail, this approach claims that we're able to take up each of two incompatible standpoints, a practical, deliberative, first-person or subjective point of view from which we decide and act, and a theoretical, scientific, explanatory, third-person point of view or objective point of view from which we observe, describe, and explain. So here's the actor. This is the theoretic, or sorry, the practical, first-person deliberative point of view, here's the observer, here's the scientific, third person, practical, or theoretical point of view. When we occupy the first point of view, the point of view of agency, we take ourselves to be free. 
But when we occupy the second point of view, when we reflect upon our agency and start to describe or explain it, we appear to ourselves not as agents, but as objects. And our actions appear as mere events. So it's as though when we turn here and look at it side on, this plane just becomes a line and we don't see anything of it. Okay. As Nagel put it, quote, something in the idea of agency is incompatible with actions being events or people being things. And so when we occupy the second reflective explanatory point of view, our agency disappears. We seem to ourselves mere machines pushed along by external determinants. Like a vampire, agency does not appear in reflection. Now this account of the problem is thought at once to provide a solution because we're not entitled to conclude, so the story goes, we're not entitled to conclude from the fact that our freedom does not appear when we theorize ourselves as empirical subjects, that our freedom is only an illusion. That illicit conclusion could only be reached by improperly privileging the theoretical point of view over the practical, when neither could be given priority. In fact, though the two points of view paint contrasting pictures, they cannot actually conflict with one another. Agency is not the kind of thing that could be understood and explained empirically or scientifically. And moreover, this is shown to be so on principled grounds. Agency, on this view, is thus hidden behind a shroud of in principle mystery, safely isolated from the scientific purview. Now, though this is a venerable and sophisticated position, I am unable to find it convincing. And my difficulty is simply that agency isn't so mysterious. We can, in fact, explain both it and its operation quite well, so long as we stay at certain levels of description. Moreover, as we've seen, agency can't be mysterious. An event qualifies as an action, as an exercise of human agency, only if it occurs because someone meant for something to occur. But the fact that someone meant for something to occur must be explicable in psychological terms. Now, some think that we should simply acknowledge that agency is explicable and that our intuitive notion of freedom is unrealistic. We created this problem by dabbling in the supernatural, by identifying agency with the operation of otherworldly souls. And in our disappointment in realizing that we're merely natural worldly agents, we feel we aren't free. But I think we can give a better and deeper diagnosis than this one. We can identify the features of our agency that lead us to model ourselves as souls in the first place without insisting on incompatible standpoints. So begin with what I call the ordinary notion of control. When we think about what it is to exercise control, we naturally think of the control we exercise over ordinary objects, such as cars and chairs, or the control we exercise with respect to our own intentional actions, such as doing a backflip or writing our name. These cases invite a certain model, according to which what it is to control something is to be able to conform it to your will, to be able to bring the thing to be as you would have it to be. Crudely put, exercising contro control of the ordinary sort is a matter of representing some change and causing the change you represent. Control of this ordinary sort displays two characteristics. First, you must be, in some sense, aware of that which you control. You must, in some sense, have in mind both the object you will control and the change you mean to effect in it. Second, to whatever extent you control something in this way, to that extent you enjoy a kind of discretion with respect to it. You're able to bring it to be how you will have it to be. Now, it's clear enough why this notion of control, with its two-part structure of controller and object controlled, leads us to think of ourselves, insofar as we're agents, as a power to affect changes in the world. But why would it seem to us that the operation of that power must be inexplicable or mysterious in order to be freely exercised? Well, note first that when you control some object, you need not think about your mind. Though you must have in mind the object of your control, you need not have in mind the psychological operations by which you exercise control. Your will can remain, so to speak, behind the lens, out of view. You're here occupying the practical, deliberative, subjective point of view. 
Moreover, and more importantly, notice that you cannot exercise control over an object simply by dis observing, describing, or explaining the operation of your own mind or will. To exercise control, you have to make something like a decision. And uh, if you're going to make anything like a decision, you will need to make it. No amount of observing, describing, or thinking about how the decision-making process is going to unfold will unfurl it. So we need to examine that more closely. Notice that determining what you shall do in the sense of making a decision about your future is a different process than determining what you will do in the sense of making a prediction about your future. You might predict that you will lose the match. That's very different than deciding to throw the match. Both will leave you with what is, in some sense, the same view of your future. You will lose the match. But in the first case, you come to this view by considering ordinary evidence, considerations that show it likely that your opponent will better you. In the second case, you do so by considering instead features of your situation that you take to count in favor of bringing about your own loss. Likewise, you might predict, in fact, you might know that the scientists, the neuroscientists, are going to send you out for a walk. That alone will not get you walking. If you're going to go for a walk intentionally, that is, if the neuroscientists are going to get you to walk by controlling your mind rather than just your body, then you will have to go for a walk because you meant to. You'll have to decide to go for a walk. So if they're going to get you to walk intentionally, then they need to get you to make that decision. But predicting, believing, or even knowing that you're going to make a decision is not the same thing as making it. So there are two routes, so to speak, to the conclusion that you will lose or that you will go for a walk. One route is occupied by predictions and prospect, explanations and retrospect, while the other is occupied by decisions in prospect and something like justifications in retrospect. You travel the first route by answering the theoretical question of whether you will go for a walk, where that's understood as a question you could ask about anyone, whether I'll go for a walk, whether Luce will go for a walk, whether Bill will go for a walk. In settling this first question, you arrive at an ordinary belief, one which happens to be about yourself. The considerations you use to settle this first question, if you use any, will be those you take to show it likely that you or Bill or Luce will go for a walk. I'm going to finish my drawings here. Uh, so I might ask whether I will go for a walk. And I might ask whether to walk. I'm going to have some considerations that I take to bear on these questions. That's supposed to be me walking. OK. So you travel the second route by uh, answering a different question. Not the question of whether you will go for a walk, but rather the question of whether to go for a walk. The second question is not, so to speak, about anyone. In settling the second question, you arrive at an intention to go for a walk. And crucially, whatever considerations you use to settle that second question will be, in virtue of your so using them, considerations that you take to count in favor of or count against walking. Now, it should be noted and granted that predictions and decisions regularly interact. Good decision making requires making predictions about yourself, whether you're likely to choke in the clutch, whether you're likely to give in to temptation. Nonetheless, they remain starkly different kinds of mental operation. And because they're different in kind, you simply can't make a decision by making a prediction. You can't decide to lose by predicting you'll lose or decide to go for a walk by predicting or even knowing that the neuroscientist will send you on a walk. Knowing even in great detail how they will send you on a walk will not itself get you walking intentionally. You have to make your decision. You have to settle for yourself positively the practical question of whether to walk, just to say they have to make you settle that question. Now recall, when you address the practical question, any considerations you employ will, in virtue of that employment, 
be taken to bear on the practical question of whether to act. If instead you take those considerations to bear on a predictive question, you will, in virtue of that shift, no longer be addressing the practical question. And so you'll no longer be making a decision. But if you're going to go walking, you have to make a decision. You have to settle the question of whether to walk. And as you settle that question, of what relevance is the undoubted fact that the scientists will make you walk? Its relevance to your decision could only be this. It might somehow either count in favor of or count against walking. That's the only relevance it could have in relation to the question of whether to walk, simply because that's the only relevance any factor consideration can have in relation to that question. And you must answer that question if you're to walk intentionally. And so it is that decisions are isolated from explanations from, as it is sometimes put, the first person point of view. It's not that we're otherworldly substances immune from prior causal influence, nor that there's some unbridgeable conceptual gulf between explanation and agency, nor even that we must regard our own decisions as inexplicable when we occupy our own point of view. It's simply that the question of whether to act is not the question of how it will come about that you act. Those are different questions. And any fact we employ in answering the first will, in that employment, simply not bear on the second. And so it is that we must, as Kant put it, act under the idea of freedom. So here's an alternative diagnosis, an account of why we think actions can't be both explicable and free. Because no amount of knowing or understanding how a decision will come about will get that decision made. Because we can't regard anything as causing or explaining our decisions in the making of them, we erroneously come to think that our decisions can't be caused or explained at all or that if they were, they wouldn't be real decisions. We wouldn't be free. We come to think that were our decisions caused, we'd be in the same position we're in when someone else manipulates our will for his or her purposes. And thus we come to think that if we're to make real decisions, we must be prime movers unmoved. And so descends the shroud of mystery. Our actions can't be both explicable and free. And yet, as we've seen, we can't sustain that picture once we turn our attention to others. We won't cr credit another with acting unless we can understand what happened as occurring because he or she meant for something to happen, and that someone meant for something to happen must itself be explicable. OK, so far I've suggested three sources of an intuitive problem of free will. First, interfering agents, such as God and the neuroscientists. Second, alien forces at work on a will, such as would be encountered by otherworldly agents in this world. And finally, a problem that seems to appear when we notice that our actions must be explicable. Namely, to understand an event as an action, we have to be able to explain it by reference to the operation of a mind with its features. But the features of a mind are in turn explained by features of the world, in fact, by features of the world over which that mind enjoys no influence. So I believe we can and should set the first two problems aside. We should be on the lookout for interfering agents and alien forces. They are, in fact, a threat to freedom. But I'm assuming that our psychologies are not otherworldly, and so the world at large is neither an interfering agent nor an alien force. The third problem with explanation is more difficult and elusive. Again, it's not sensible to think that the conditions required for the successful operation of some process are a hindrance to that process. So it seems we should not need to free ourselves from the natural world in order to free ourselves from interference or constraint. We only need to avoid more specific threats, like the manipulation of other agents and the interference of alien forces, like diseases and drugs. Yet it can seem that explanation itself threatens freedom, and I've just offered a diagnosis as to why. Decision making, so to speak, occludes its own operation. It creates a little blind spot. Now, having come to understand the source of this third worry, one might think that we can, can and should rest easy. We've been misled by our blind spot into thinking that free action requires more than is in fact necessary. The difficulty was just an illusion. Unfortunately, it's very hard to rest easy here. It typically seems to people that in discovering this blind spot, we've discovered not that the apparent threat to our freedom was just an illusion, 
but that our freedom itself was just an illusion. People typically feel we've discovered that although we must act under the idea of freedom, although we must regard ourselves as free, what we've learned is that we're not really free. Not really. So one might return to the thought that we've been misled by dabbling in the supernatural. By living all this time with our unrecognized blind spot, we came to think that we were otherworldly agents, and we must admit that we are not that. Nonetheless, we had built this illusion into our life and come to value it. And in our disillusionment, there's a loss for us to mourn. Now, while I think that's true, I also think that we're not simply mourning the loss of a cherished illusion. There's a fourth, further important source of the intuitive problem, namely that our sense of what it is to be in control of our actions and our future leads us, when we think about the operation of our agency, to think that our own agency is not in our control. Uh, and we'll have time only to sketch that problem. So here it comes. Recall that according to the ordinary notion of control, we control a thing to the extent that we can bring it to be as we would have it to be. We might call this the represent and cause picture. We have some change in mind, and we cause that change on purpose. We make and execute decisions. But we're also reflective creatures, able to think about ourselves. And when we reflect upon ourselves as creatures who control things, we can observe our own controlling activity. And it certainly seems that the activity by which we control some object, our car or our body, should itself be in our control, or at least not out of our control, if we're be in, to be in control of the object. If the controlling activity were out of our control, as it is when we're under the control of God or the neuroscientist, it seems we're not really in control of what we thought we were controlling. Now, if the only notion of control we have is the ordinary one, it'll seem that we must somehow gain that form of control over our own controlling activities. It'll seem that we should be able to represent and bring about our own representing and bring about, bringing about. We should be able to think about and choose our own thinking and choosing. Now, some have thought that reflection will rescue us at this point, uh, that we're sophisticated creatures able to think about our own activities and act upon ourselves. And this does gain for us something like the ordinary form of control. But it doesn't get us out of our difficulty. When we manage ourselves in this way, we're engaged in some second order thought. And if the only mode of control on hand is the ordinary one, we'll have to exercise control over this second order thought by thinking about it now at the third order, and so on. Each attempt we make to get a grip on ourselves, so to speak, will move our controlling activities just a bit further out of reach. What is more and what's worse, even these higher order controlling activities are explained by things other than our own previous exercises of control. In the worst case, someone else is controlling us, imposing his or her will on ours. But even in the absence of another mind, the activities by which we control our car or our body or our mind are themselves explained by nature, nurture, luck, and the effect of our own past choices, where our own past choices are in turn ex still explained by the same until we reach a point where it's just nature, nurture, and luck. And so it seems that our choices, our controlling activities, are themselves out of our control. And so it seems that we are mere machines. Complicated and sophisticated machines, to be sure, ones that more or less reliably bring about that which they re represent, but machines nonetheless carried along by the forces of history. And so long as we provide ourselves with only the ordinary notion of control, this conclusion will seem inevitable. However, I've argued elsewhere that we have an alternative notion of control available to us, one which we can utilize to understand the control we enjoy with respect to our own thoughts. I've called this evaluative control. It's the control we exercise over our thoughts in thinking them. It's the control we exercise our, over our beliefs and intentions in settling questions. So to illustrate, suppose you believe the butler did it. You have then settled for yourself the question of whether the butler did it. You may have certain reasons for your opinion, his ready access to the home, his fascination with toxic substances, his motives for revenge. By taking these facts to settle the question of whether the butler did it, you make something true of yourself. You make it true that you believe that the butler did it. You thereby affect a change in your own psychology. 
By making up your mind about the butler's guilt, you make up your mind. You partly constitute your own psychology. And this, I claim, is a form of control, though not of the ordinary sort. I call it evaluative control. Now, evaluative control conspicuously lacks the most salient features of ordinary control, namely awareness and discretion. You need not be thinking about your mind as you make it up. Rather, you're thinking about the butler and the crime. And by thinking about something about the butler and the crime, you make something true of yourself. But you can't make true whatever you like. You can only believe what you think is true. And so it can seem that what you believe is not up to you. It can seem that you're constrained in your believing in a way that you're not in your acting. So I would argue that the kind of influence we exert over our minds uh, is a kind of control despite the fact that it is not one that uh, involves awareness or discretion. And though this must be entirely promissory, that the states of mind we form are themselves activities. If we grant ourselves these claims, claims which I think are less radical than they might appear, we can assuage the final concern about whether our controlling activities are themselves in our control. We can understand the sense in which they are. Now, does this mean that we're responsible? Is this less ordinary notion of control or agency sufficient to secure our responsibility? My answer will be, it depends on what you think responsibility is. In my bigger project, the bigger picture, I think we're going to have to address the intuitive problem of free will and moral responsibility from both sides, so to speak. We have to think about agency, as we've been doing tonight, uh, but we also have to think about responsibility and about the demands and expectations we put upon one another and about our responses to the, our successes and our failures. Many people think of moral responsibility as requiring blame, and then they think of blame as a kind of penalty or a kind of sanction imposed on wrongdoers. And evaluative control by itself is not going to justify penalties or sanctions. But I find the penalty conception of responsibility to be unattractive in its own right. And if you think of responsibility differently, then I believe you can see this sort of control as grounding it. But that is a project for another day.